Um, and crypto. I mean, certainly your passports have them and uh, all these MyFair tags. But the point is, if you have all these different keys, how do you manage them? How, for example, if you, uh, if you purchase an item, let's say that they have you know, these cryptographic keys associated with it, how do you collect the key? How do you store it? Let's say that I'm, in the, I'm walking down the street and I decide I'm feeling paranoid and I decide I want to kill my tag. How do I do that in practice? If you have such a device with you, of course any RFID reader can do this, <laughs> but the point is if you have anything that can function as an RFID reader that has this key information, you can then decide, now I want to turn it off. <laughs> but what's useful about the Guardian is because it can do uh, two-way RFID communications, I mean it can act like a tag, the point is you can now do key transfer without requiring any extra infrastructure besides the actual RFID infrastructure that is already present. Because people have discussed, you know, why don't you use Bluetooth and then send it to a PDA and then, you know, maybe have a reader with your PDA. <laughs> that, that's all fine, but that requires extra infrastructure. Uh, same thing if you wanted to give them keys printed on receipts and things like that. This is just an easier way. Uh, access control, so basically you cre we, we've already created uh, the access control mechanism. Uh, we actually have ACLs just like a packet filter. Uh, there's an example ACL that we work with. I mean, generally the way that our rules look is we'll say, uh, you have the first line of your ACL, we will say, uh, allow all queries uh, from all readers to all tags. This is sort of the default. Then the next line that makes things a bit more specific will say, but deny all queries from all readers targeting my tags. And then you have a list uh, that we populate that creates what tags belong to me. So do I have a passport with me? Are there tags in my clothing? Uh, do I have one on my credit card? And then the point is then, let's say the next line down, if you want to make it more specific, you can then say, but, I would like, uh, you know, only uh, my reader, my trusted reader at home, to be able to query uh, the tag, perhaps in my clothing. Or I would only like the reader at, at, uh, at, at Schiphol Airport <laughs> in the Netherlands to be able to make a query towards my passport. Now, of course, the last detail in, in constructing these kinds of ACLs is this is all well and good, but how do you actually know where the query is coming from? Well, this isn't, this isn't simple, this isn't obvious, but what we do is uh, using a two-way, this two-way RFID channel, we actually use read and write multiple block queries to be able to transmit information, including cryptographic information, <laughs> over RFID. So literally what we are doing in, in the prototype that we've been working on is we are using SSL over RFID. <laughs> it's a sort of one of those constructions. <laughs> Granted, it doesn't, it doesn't get the best bandwidth in the world. <laughs> but the point is that as lo it doesn't require any extra infrastructure. As long as you have the readers uh, that speak RFID and, and your guardian, then just using a normal RFID channel, <laughs> First, we use SSL. Uh, basically, you have a shared key between the reader and the guardian. They use SSL to do authentication, and then they share a session key. What we do then is we use the session key to encrypt uh, basically, basically individual authenticated packets, uh, announcing what query the RFID reader is immediately about to perform. So the way that it works is, we, we, for the queries themselves, we have a two-packet system. The first one is this uh, authentication receipt. The second one is the query itself. Why don't we just put cryptographic information in the query itself? Uh, the answer is because generally in the RFID protocol, there's no room for it. <laughs> uh, this is more of a political issue than a technical one. It would be very easy to add an extra field to the ISO standard uh, for authentication receipts. Why is it not in there? Because if... Uh, uh, people have proposed putting it in standards like ISO 18000, but if uh, the standard has changed at all, even to add extra security features that technically are just a no-brainer to implement, the point is it obsoletes, uh, I mean, there are companies that are involved and that make their entire living from RFID, and these kinds of changes to the standard obsolete their product line. 
So in these standardization committees, you have these companies that are earning their entire living from RFID, and they are actively fighting against changing the standards <laughs> to, to add this extra security information, this extra field where you can say, okay, this query now belongs to an authenticated session. And because we, I mean, just me personally, I don't have you know, the power to change that. Uh, that's why I've had to use this sort of two-packet system. It's a little bit of a kludge, but it works, <laughs> to be able to actually say that this particular query is part of this authenticated session, where the query itself is actually completely anonymous, because I have no way of actually putting extra information in there. So, so what so the reader does is it uh, says, it announces, I am about to do this query. So let's say, I am about to query your passport. It also throws a nonce in there, so you can't replay it. And then it encrypts it with a session key. And what happens is then immediately after sending this uh, sort of receipt saying, I'm about to do this query, it then sends the query. So the point is, it has to happen immediately afterwards so an attacker won't inject his own query in between there. Uh, if the attacker does try to inject something at the same time, it'll just be garbled because it'll interfere with each other. But the point is, in such a way, we are actually able to know that this particular query is coming from this particular reader. And that's how the Guardian uh, does it. So, uh, so good. Um, so we had some problems with V2 that we're trying to improve. <laughs> uh, we're further working on optimizing uh, the read range, because, uh, well, like I said, we made a small mistake uh, in V2 with that. Uh, what we're also doing with V3 is, first of all, we're adding uh, Bluetooth. Why? Because our idea is, if you have uh, this device sort of attached to your belt, you would want some kind of easy way of communicating with it. We thought about putting a screen on it, and we decided that one, that's probably not too handy, and two, that's pretty expensive. <laughs> Uh, although I do have to say we have uh, a place where you could plug in a TFT screen, would you want to? But uh, our idea is you would use uh, a cell phone, like a Bluetooth-enabled cell phone. We'd be running SSL basically over the Bluetooth connection, because we, yes, we know about, about Bluetooth security, <laughs> or lack thereof. And the point is then you can use your phone via a Java applet uh, as, as a user interface. Uh, so if on the fly you want to configure your Guardian or uh, you know, do some key transfers on the fly or, or do something, you, you can basically use your cell phone to interface with it. Other changes uh, that we're making, uh, we are trying to uh, actually make the next version cheaper. Uh, we were using some unnecessary components uh, in V2, like crystals that were a bit expensive. Uh, we're, we're trying to see if we can replace some of that stuff to make it cheaper. What you actually see right now is not the final V3. It is not the final product. It's what we're using at the moment to do testing. And the difference between uh, V2 and V3 is you can see now there are all these... Essentially what this is is it's a backplane. It's like a motherboard. And now what we're doing is we're actually taking each individual component, like the Bluetooth module, and plugging it in. So now if we actually make a, uh, make a mistake, or if we have a problem with one of these individual uh, boards, or with one of these designs, in V2, if we made a mistake, it was all on the same board, so it was a real pain in the butt to fix it. <laughs> but now with V3, we're actually individually uh, testing each component, and if it turns out something's broken, we're just going to say, okay, no problem, unplug it, <laughs> and then redesign. But the ultimate V3 isn't going to look like this. Uh, the ultimate V3 is actually going to be professionally produced. <laughs> Because uh, we would actually like to make this into a real thing, and we would actually like to see if we can distribute these in some way, shape, or form, so people who want to use this technology can. <laughs> but what we're doing now, for now at least, is uh, we're, we're still doing the design ourselves, trying to get the pieces right, and as soon as we have a design that works it, basically in all the facets that we want and that we need, we're then going to say, okay, let's make this as simple as possible and get it off to a professional place that can fabricate the PCBs for us and, uh, and uh, you know, populate it with chips and things like that. So that's our idea. And also another thing is once we're actually done uh, with stabilizing our design, um, we're also planning on releasing all of it uh, as open source both the hardware schematics and also the software.
Great. And uh, yeah, I mean that, that's that's pretty much the story with the with the guardian. So, uh, ooh, how did that slide get in there? <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, so, are, does anyone have any questions? Can you be a bit more specific about your development policy and your prospective uh, production policy, both with respect to software and with respect to the hardware design? What do you mean by development policy? I don't know if you have distinct policies or whether you even have a policy at the moment with openness. Um, well, we've discussed a little bit about like licenses. I, I thought we concluded on using a BSD license for what we could, except for the components that already use GPL, so we're kind of stuck. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, th that, that would be my answer, probably BSD to the extent with which we can. So. Uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, we, 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 we still need to discuss this a bit more extensively, extensively once we get that far, but I figure it's probably going to be about six months, probably another six months before we are that far, so, yeah. Um, just one comment, um, you won't be able to selectively block the passport because of the um, randomly generated UID. Uh, no, but the UID is only randomly generated with, uh, for example, EPC tags, because the passport... No, 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 in a passport. Definitely. Oh, you mean with the, uh, with the American ones? No, in oh. everyone, in the um, yes. Dutch and in the Germans, definitely. Um, well, it, I, I would say it depends, because uh, there are some kinds of tags that use randomly generated identifiers. Yeah, I, right. I'm talking about the passport. Right, I know, I'm about to answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are multiple... Uh, tag, kinds of tags that randomly generate UIDs. The point is uh, that would then, uh, during singulation, yeah, if, if, if it's really truly randomly generated, of course I have to say pseudo-randomly, <laughs> but the point is uh, if you don't know the uh, seed to the pseudo-random number generator and you don't know where it is in the sequence, and indeed during singulation you wouldn't be able to block it, which prevents tracking. However, uh, what isn't random is uh, once you actually attempt to communicate it with it, it needs a static identifier so you can actually communicate with it. So the point is once you actually want to do read and write operations with it, uh, you can certainly control those kinds of things and, and also with the passport. But, but I was having that same discussion actually about EPC tags. So yeah, indeed. Any other questions? Uh, hello. The, about the the, the pricing, you said that you're going to try and make it cheaper, but do you have any price indication on how much it will cost? Um, it depends on what we do with our design. The actual, uh, the, the bits that we've built ourselves are very cheap. I'm talking like, you know, 30, 40 euros cheap. <laughs> What is expensive is the Triton module that we've been using because the PXA270 Triton module costs 330 euros. <laughs> the point is if we can uh, redesign that, but remember this is an engineering problem, not a research problem, but still if we could somehow replace, get rid of the middleman <laughs> and just solder our own PXA270 and everything, that would eliminate a whole lot of the, uh, the, the price from the equa equation. And then I would assume in that case we could probably get it down to I don't know, 100 euros or something like that. But also, I mean, even with uh, if we decide that the Triton 270 module is overkill, if we could scale back to a Triton uh, 250 module, also from strategic test, those things actually only cost, I think, about, I think, 80 euros a piece. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. So we're hoping to get it somewhere around in the neighborhood of about 100 euros. So, any other questions? Do you really need a complete X scale for this? I can't imagine you can, can, can't use some smaller processor which doesn't oh. cost 100 euro or so. It depends on what subset of the functionality uh, we want to we go with. Because if we're just building an emulator, you don't need much horsepower for that. I mean, you can adequately use a PIC or an Atmel <laughs> or one of the cheaper microprocessors if all you want to do is emulation or if all you want to do is like replay attacks. <laughs> uh, but we think that the part that is going to require sort of the horsepower, so to say, is uh, SSL. <laughs> so as soon as we're doing this uh, authentication and as soon as we're actually, uh, you know, packet, per packet by packet, <laughs> you know, authorizing, uh, I mean, I think this is the, what, what's going to take the most uh, processing power. And essentially, in the next six months, we hope to actually get 